So I have the honor this morning of introducing, we had this planned um, when we uh, knew that Brian was going to take his Sabbath time, which we're honored to grant to him. Um, we asked our regional minister, Reverend Joshua Patty, and he said this morning it's okay if it's just Josh. Um, we asked him to come and share with us today. And so it is my honor to um, introduce to you and to hear a word from uh, Josh Patty. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. It is good to join you in person. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as your regional minister and president. That means I get to travel all around and I have the opportunity to represent you to other congregations. I get the opportunity to represent other congregations to you, 118 congregations and 200 of our colleagues in ministry in Iowa, Minnesota, North and South Dakota. So on behalf of all of them, it is my privilege and pleasure to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this day. It is awful good to worship with you, the good folks of First Christian Keokuk, this day. Um, an extra special joy is to thank you for the ways that you support and share in our regional ministry. Um, the ways that you support our Christian Conference Center and our camping program, which is going on now. Let's see, today, Junior Camp and one of our Cairo Camps are coming in, um, I think this afternoon, not as we speak, but um, they'll be out there this week. I know some of you have journeyed out there to be with us in many ways, volunteering, serving as counselors, sending your young people with us to, to grow, sharing Noel with us. We're grateful for all of that and the ways that you support our ministry, supporting our colleagues and supporting other congregations all around this area. That said, it's my privilege to present a message to you. So hear these words from the third chapter of Galatians, Paul's letter to the congregations in Galatia. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Paul, as he is wont to do, continues, but we'll stop there and focus on these verses. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, now we come to that time in our worship when we open the scriptures and seek your wisdom and guidance for our lives. Open us up. Open our ears. Open our minds. Open our hearts to the lessons that you have for us this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have two sacraments in our tradition, in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. One we celebrate every Sunday, gathering at the Lord's table in Jesus' name, communion. The other is baptism. We don't usually celebrate that every Sunday. You don't have enough members to have baptisms every Sunday, do you? We're not a Southern Baptist megachurch, so no. They're the only ones I know that have baptisms almost every Sunday, in this country at least. In fact, we, we don't have baptisms all that often. I think we don't talk about it enough, so I wanted to talk about it with you and think about it a little with you today. So a quick question, and there's no guilt in this. This is not, I'm not taking toll or names or anything, but how many of you were, are baptized? Okay, so most of the people in this room, how many of you remember your baptism? Okay, how many of you were baptized when you were too young to remember? Some of you, Okay. That's all right. One baptism in Christ. There's, again, no judgment. One baptism. So the baptistry is up here. I like to wander around when I preach, so we'll come up by the baptistry when I'm talking about baptism. I was baptized when I was 12, so I remember my baptism. I was not raised in this tradition. I was raised in an independent church uh, that didn't even have a pastor, so um, we didn't have a baptistry in the building. So it was in July when I was baptized with DJ, who was a year older than me, and we borrowed a swimming pool. And uh, we didn't wear robes, which is how I baptized as a congregational preacher. I dressed pretty much like this. I got to take my shoes off, but otherwise, this is how I went into the water. We didn't have cell phones to worry about back then, so 
none of that. And there was no preacher. My grandfather is one of the four elders of that church. He baptized me. He had a suit, a brown 70s polyester suit that he wore, and he didn't mind getting wet after all those years, so it's always what he wore to baptize people. So I remember, so I remember basically I was dressed, and I remember what my grandfather's wearing. I remember that after that, it was on Sunday afternoon. We had had worship in the morning. Sunday afternoon, we were baptized. And um, after that, uh, I changed into a bathing suit. We had a, ba- uh, we had a pool party and a barbecue, which is not exactly tradition, I think, and, but maybe it should be. I think it's a good celebration of baptism. But regardless, that's what I remember about my baptism. I don't remember anything that was said that day. And specifically, I don't remember what I promised when I was baptized. I mean, I'm certain that I must have said that I was a sinner and I recognized it and I promised to dedicate my life to Jesus in some way, but I don't remember those promises. Any of you remember the promises you made when you were baptized? A couple of you do. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God. It's good. Here's the other thing. It was not a test, but good. Um, I imagine the church made promises to me that day, too. I don't remember any of those. Do any of you remember the promises the church made to you when you were either baptized in this baptistry or somewhere else? Yeah, that's... That's my personal experience, and that's my experience as a congregational pastor. We don't remember those so much, and that's a shame. So that's why I wanted to preach out of this letter to the churches of Galatia from Paul. You may or may not know, but this is uh, thought to be an ancient baptism song or something that stated the belief of Christians that, of what baptism means. And what it means is that we're all baptized into one faith, one church in the name of Christ, and there's no division, no Jew or Greek, no ethnic distinctions, no slave or free, no legal or economic distinctions, no male nor female, no gender distinctions. All are one in Christ Jesus. Whether we know it or not, in some way or another, that is a promise the church has made over the centuries, and it's a promise the church has made to us in our baptisms. And I guess the question is, how well are we living it out? Paul didn't just idly insert this song about baptism into this letter to the churches of of Galatia. He was addressing a particular thing. And you're forgiven if you don't remember exactly what he was writing about, but I'll tell you. Um, Paul had helped plant some churches in the area of Galatia, which if memory serves is in modern-day Turkey. Um, Geography is not that important to this lesson. Uh, And then he moved on to plant other churches, and some other Christian teachers came behind him. And they said, you know, you're all good Christians. You all want to be great Christians, right? Okay, well, in order to be better Christians than you are now, you have to be more Jewish. Be more Jewish, and then you'll be better Christians, because after all, Jesus was, by heritage, a Jew. And Paul, not to put it too lightly, um, was infuriated by this. And you can, the, the anger comes through his letter, and particularly the first three ch- chapters comes through very clearly. Um, how angry he was at this suggestion that somehow there were different tiers of Christians, that there were good Christians and better Christians and best Christians. Paul said, no, there are Christians. All of us are one in Christ Jesus. Don't you remember what you promised and what the church baptized, promised you when you were baptized? All are one. All are one in Christ Jesus. And as we're thinking about baptism, I guess my question today is, how well are we living that out? How well have we lived it out? I'm kind of a vegetables and dessert kind of guy. So the vegetables first, the healthy 
unpleasant stuff for some people like vegetables. I shouldn't give vegetables a hard rap from the pulpit. That's not polite. What did vegetables ever do to us? Um, But let's be honest. We know that the church has not always fully embraced this. In fact, sometimes the church has lived into the very divisions that Jesus wanted us to overcome and transform in our day-to-day lives. About 100 years ago, a historian and theologian by the name of H. Richard Niebuhr, and you don't have to take notes on this, but uh, wrote a book called The Social Sources of Denominationalism. And unlike some academic works, the title really does say what he writes about, how the divisions in the church in the United States context were caused by social divisions, not by theological ones. And in fact, he writes about some of the divisions that Paul was writing about 1,900 years before him, particularly ones of ethnicity, economics, and legal status. I mean, I don't have to tell you that some people of different ethnic heritages traditionally belong to different churches, do I? I mean, after all, if I asked you, uh, uh, Germans... What, what church are people of German ancestry likely to worship in, if not today, a hundred years ago? Lutheran, or occasionally Mennonite and Amish. Lutheran, though, primarily. How about people from Scotland? Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Okay, the Catholics are a little all over the place, so we, we leave them out. We can come back to the Catholics. Well, we're going to leave them out. They're more complicated. Presbyterians. Presbyterians come from Scotland because their founder came from Scotland. Uh, If you're from England, a couple options in this country, historically speaking, if you're from England. Episcopalian, which is known as the Church of England in England, so that should give you a hint. Or the tradition that came off of them, the Methodist Episcopal Church, which we usually call Methodists or United Methodists today. And then a smattering of Baptists from all over, and yes, Catholics from all over. It was really noticeable in communities where they spoke different languages. But even within English speaking, do you see the diversity of religious traditions? Economically speaking, wealthier people, this is always a fun game in different towns, where do the wealthy people in this town go to church? Anybody know? Maybe, maybe hopefully all over. That would be great. Historically speaking, Episcopalian. Where do the poorer people go to church? Historically speaking, Baptist and Methodist. And disciples, too, because we're one of those frontier edge of settlement congregations or, or, or movements, denominations. And then here's the hard part. It's two out of the ten chapters in Niebuhr's book, divisions by race and status in the church about 200 years ago. First, divisions by race. White people and black people going to different churches. In one of the predominant African-American traditions, it's still existent in their name if you recognize it. As I said before, Some of the English settlers were the Methodist Episcopal Church. You've probably heard of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There's no difference in structure. There's no difference in theology. There certainly wasn't when they were established 200 years ago. The difference is that some of them were white and some of them were black. And then legal distinctions When slavery became an issue north and south in this country, the churches split over it. And there became northern Presbyterians and southern Presbyterians, northern Methodists and southern Methodists, northern Baptists and southern Baptists. Since then, some of those churches have... We like to say in the disciples' tradition, we never split. That's sign of practically true and practically not. Most of our congregations were north, 
and eventually the Restorationist movement split north and south between what becomes the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and what become the Churches of Christ out of that movement. Eventually there's some reunion. The Methodists, North and South, come together. That's part of what it means to be a part of the United Methodist Church. The Presbyterians, North and South, come back together. It's why their denomination is called the Presbyterian Church, United States of America. And the Northern Baptists are now known as American Baptists, and the Southern Baptists are known as Southern Baptists still, sadly. All are one in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we have fallen far short of that. Sometimes not. So that's the harder part. Here's the happier part. There are ways that we and others like us, our ancestors in faith, have lived into this. All are one in Christ Jesus in ways that have benefited across denominational lines, benefited the communities where the church has been active. I'm a recipient of a public education, at least K through 12, any of you will receive a public education? It was Christians in this country, particularly Baptists, but Christians who said everybody, everybody in this country should learn to read. And by the way, what was a little revolutionary at the time, they and, and Presbyterians and others said everybody, little boys and little girls, Everybody should learn to read. They thought it was an evangelism tool, not that religion was taught in the schools, but they thought if you could read, you could read the Bible, and if you could read the Bible for yourself, you would know the truth of the gospel, and you would become Christians. That wasn't the sum total of, of, of education, though. At the same time, groups of Christians across denominations started Sunday school programs to supplement that public education. So you learn to read and write and do your arithmetic in public school, and then in Sunday school, you'd learn the context of the Bible and the Christian tradition. That educational movement crossed denominational lines, and it was offered to everybody, whether they were a part of the church or not, because the church thought Every child had value in God's eyes. Everybody merited a good education. Period. Full stop. Another way, hospitals. Every community is blessed by hospitals. Well, every community these days of a certain size is blessed by hospitals. Most of them were started by churches. Occasionally, some were started by synagogues, by people of Jewish tradition. But almost all of them, unless they're university hospitals now, university medical centers, were started by people of faith. And, they, and some of them still carry those names, Methodist hospitals or Catholic hospitals that are St. Joseph's or St. Mary's or St. You know, Baptist hospitals. But they weren't built just to serve Methodists or Roman Catholics, or Jews, or Baptists. They were built because, just like in public education, people recognized all of God's children deserved good medical care. And it was the church's opportunity to live that out and make that a reality in, the, in their communities. All are one in Christ Jesus. So we have an uneven heritage of living into our baptisms, living into the promises that we made in our baptisms, living into the promises that were made to us in our baptisms. We don't talk about baptism enough in the church, I don't think. We don't remember how important it is for us to be a part of this, to build this deep spiritual connection with God that not only changes us individually, but then puts us into groups of people so we can change together and change people beyond us in good ways, reorienting our communities in ways that are more closely match God's value system rather than a human value system. 
I mean, we don't have to go too far to find people that, well, there's these people, and then 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 there's, uh, I mean, these people. That's not God's way. It's not Jesus' way. Our opportunity is to live differently and to invite other people to live differently. So what can we do to remember our baptisms better? Some of our siblings in faith, particularly Roman Catholics and Episcopalians, have a service during Holy Week, the Saturday of Holy Week every year, called the Great Vigil of Easter. Any of you familiar with the Great Vigil of Easter? A couple of people, perhaps raised Roman Catholic, maybe not, yeah. The Great Vigil of Easter, I like to describe it as the greatest hits of the church. There are four parts to it. Traditionally, it goes from sundown to sunrise, but they don't last nearly as long these days, but still a long service. Four parts, a service of light, the returning of the light of Christ into the community of faith after the darkness of Good Friday. The second part is a series of lessons of God's powerful, mighty, saving hand reaching into human history, mostly taken from Old Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. The third section always is a service of baptism. In the Roman Catholic tradition, for adults, that's traditionally when adults are baptized still. On Holy Saturday at the Great Vigil of Easter. The fourth, by the way, is a celebration of communion at sunrise, which is where the tradition of the sunrise service comes from. It grows out of the Great Vigil of Easter, lasting all night. Something powerful about celebrating communion at what the Bible says is kind of the moment of resurrection. Because when they arrived at sunup, the stone was rolled away, and he is not here, he is risen. But the third section is baptism, every time. And whether somebody is baptized or not in the service, there is always a service of baptism in the great vigil of Easter. Because it's so meaningful in the church. And my favorite part of that is there's a point when the celebrant, when the priest, when the pastor, after the people have been baptized, after the water's been blessed, baptized, comes out and shares that and invites everybody gathered to remember their baptisms, usually taking palm leaves. When I do it bound together so they can hold the water and then going around and spreading water and saying, remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. All around the sanctuary, remember your baptism. It takes almost as long as the celebration of communion because it's that important to invite people to remember your baptisms. My goodness, you're all back here. Remember your baptisms. I'm going to come this way first because there's four people over here. And our sound people, remember your baptisms. I'd have musicians that I'd have to deal with. I would dribble water right above their heads so as to not get equipment or instruments wet. But to invite them to to remember their baptisms. We don't remember our baptisms enough. And we don't emphasize it enough to remember your baptisms. Remember your baptisms. Remember the promises you made or have other people remind you of them. And remember the promises that were made to you or have people remind you of them. And not just to remember so that it continues to change you and change our church so that we become more like what Jesus wants. And I might add, and you can kind of see where this is going, right? more of what our, the people around us, and sometimes even you and me, desperately need. That it is not differences that make us who we are, or make us important or not important. All are one in Christ Jesus. It's our great opportunity and our great challenge to live into and live out that promise of our faith. 
it is so good to join with you this day. So good to worship with you. May God continue to bless you and bless others through you. Amen.